We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew Marshall, and welcome to The Meaningful Life. We're available on Apple, Spotify, Podbeam, Amazon Music, and wherever you find your podcasts. Where would you be without your friends? They are a source of companionship, practical and emotional support, and even meaning. But friends can also be a source of pain and strife. My witness today is Dr. Suzanne Degis white who is Professor and Chair of the Department of Counselling and Higher Education at North Illinois University and a licensed counsellor in private practice. She's the co-author of Toxic Friendship, Knowing the Rules and Dealing with Friends Who Break Them. So how are we defining friends? Are we talking Facebook friends, acquaintances, good friends, best friends? Help us understand. Well, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. It's exciting to talk about friends. And the beautiful thing about friendship is it can be defined in so many different ways. So all of our friends have value in our life because life is about relationship. And some of us may value our Facebook friends. They're the ones we're able to connect with on a daily, multiple times basis. Others may more value the folks who are their face-to-face friends. So when we use the term friendship, it really does encompass a great variety of folks who interact with us, that we engage with, and that play a role in our lives. Now, you've put the focus in your book mainly on female friendships. What do you think is the difference between men's friendships and women's friendships? That's a big question. That is a big question. It's interesting because when you see research on friendships among men, typically their friendships really focus on things they do together, activity friends, long histories together. And women's friendships often have a deeper, more emotional connection that they verbalize and they address. Men's friendships are deep, long-lasting, enduring, but a lot of things that they enjoy in their friends are things that women want to pick apart and dissect in their own friendships or relationships. I mean, I work with couples and a lot of my female clients say about their husbands, uh, they don't have any friends or they have very few friends. I mean, there does seem to be a sort of a a numbers game here. Yeah. You know, there is because women do tend to have larger social circles. And it's because for women, we're brought up to be connected to others. Connections kind of define who we are. We see our roles as very much important. And our roles have to do with friend, with parent, with sister, with daughter, all those different roles that come across in life. And men, as a rule, really value who they are in their profession or their accomplishments. And so while they value the things they're doing, women often are more aware of of the ways in which they're being with other people. So how important is friendship to us? Friendship is essential. Healthy relationships, you work with couples, you know how important it is to have that relationship. Relationships truly are what give our lives meaning. When I was training to become a counselor, I'll never forget some of the reading I did. And one of the William Glasser who um, did choice theory said that there are only two reasons people ever seek counseling. One is poor relationships and the second is no relationships. Having relationships, being connected with people, that really is a measure of our own sense of well-being. It's our way to stay healthy. Longevity has been connected to how often we see friends, our level of engagement. And so without friendships, without connection, we really are kind of adrift in life. There's no one to check on us. There's no one to check in with. And we really start to feel the sense of isolation that can be so devastating to us physically, emotionally, mentally. So I think friendships are key to a healthy, happy life. Because as I was reading your book, the thing that struck me that I hadn't really thought about very much is how our friendships change over time and that they have different roles and different stages of our lives. Tell me about that. 
Yeah. You know, as we change, you work with couples, you know that people change over time and we do change. What's important to you when you were 11 probably isn't so essential to you at 21, 31 on through life. And so when we go through life and stages of life, the role our friendships play really does take a different significance and a different valence. When we're little girls, little boys, we learn how to get along with others through our friendships. When we go to adolescence, there's that sense we we kind of really the same sex friendships start to merge with opposite sex friendships. We begin to see ourselves as part of a social world. And in adolescence, our friendships will play the strongest role that they ever will in our lives because who we identify with in our adolescent years is really we're testing out our own identity and our friendships really provide a mirror of who we are and who we think we are. We want to dress like our friends. We want to use the lingo that our friends use. We want to listen to the same music as our friends. It's so important for our friends to kind of serve as those touchstones of who we are becoming. But then as we move through life and we kind of solidify our identities, we kind of figure out who we are, we begin to choose friends who often are at the same place we are or the places where we want to go. It's kind of like dress for the job you want, not the job you have, it's like we begin to think of friendships and relationships as ways to kind of, where are we going? Who's going to help us get there? And this can be, you know, professionally, we might want friends who are the next level ahead or in a different field when we're thinking of changing careers. Or it may be we're getting ready to have a child, we're getting ready to go through a divorce, and then we need friends who are going to help kind of be the guides for us, kind of those wayfarers who will help us manage these big transitions in life. So having friends in life really reflects who we are at that moment, where we're going at that moment, and what we need in our lives. And so just as we change and grow, so should our relationships. And that's when we kind of get to that idea of friendships that break. When a friendship isn't dynamic enough to really accept the changes and the growth and the development that one or other of the parties are having, that's when friendships can kind of fly apart. And so who we are kind of guides who we need as friends, where we see ourselves going, also kind of directs us to what kind of friends we're going to be looking for. And yet without those friends, we kind of, like I said, we're kind of lost in a drift because friends help us move through life, help us identify who we are and help us clarify our values too. What do you make of this famous quote from Stephen King in the movie Stand By Me? I'm sure you've heard it before. I never had any friends later on like the ones I had when I was 12. Jesus, does anyone? No. You know, when we are young like that, you know, we we feel, especially 12, 13, we really are beginning to break away from who our families are. You know, we're really trying to strive for seeing ourselves as unique, as separate, distinct from mom, from dad, from siblings, from all those people. And when we're striking out on our own, we need that band of brothers. We need that band of sisters. And that friendship is kind of like, we talk about, so I know someone talks about we have to have that true blue in our life. And when we're 12, 13, we are so vulnerable to the world. You know, we don't know who we are yet. We're trying to figure it out. And friends give us that sense of connection. And there's again, that sense of almost like a tribe. I've got a son who used to talk about his friends as his tribe, that he knew who he was by who his friends were. And he really, this was in, he he had self-awareness even in high school, talking about how much his friends meant to him. And it's this awareness that those people are going to be there for you. And we don't have the pulls in our time. We don't, we, we love people for who they are. And we're not thinking about what would other people think about this person? Because we're so, I said, we're vulnerable, we're raw, we're real in those early ages. It's like childhood. We are ourselves and we haven't learned to put on artifices. And so those friends, when we have with 12, they're our adventure mates or the people that are going to go, you know, be with us as we develop into the adults we're becoming. So there's that sense of, actually, I think, vulnerability, rawness, and openness to experience that we have at 12 that we won't have at 21 or on through life. The well, more self-aware we grow, the less we are open to the influence and the connection with others. I know that something is that is really difficult is if you've had this friend all this time and, you know, you really are bosom buddies, 
that one of them decides to get married, to have children, the other continues to be single. And then suddenly for the single person, her friend, and it's normally a woman who I'm talking to in my counselling room, suddenly feels completely and utterly bereft because her friend now has a child, which is they're rather time consuming children and mm-hmm. you tend to make friends with other mothers in the kindergarten yeah. or wherever else and it can feel completely and utterly bereft mm-hmm. and you feel alone and you feel deserted and you feel like you've been rejected and some women might even feel betrayed by this friend you know we were bfs we spent all our time together it can be going off and finding a significant other. It can be having a child. And then you might begin also to doubt yourself. Am I on the right path? You know, am I not keeping up with my friends? And how is this friend prioritizing this other person when we were so close before? And that's when toxic issues rise because when we're not able to celebrate the joys and the development of our friends, then it's not a real friendship. You know, friends aren't just meant to be there when we need them, we're also meant to be there for our friends. And to begrudge someone their happiness, to begrudge them development changes, all these magical things that happen in life, that's not real friendship. That's a dependency that does not reflect a healthy relationship. Do you think it gets harder to make friends as you get older? Well, it does in many ways. Part of the reason is our social circles and our opportunities to meet friends typically decreases as we age. Because, you know, when when we're younger, we're in school, we're in clubs, we're in activities, we're hanging out at, you know, nightclubs, whatever it might be. And friends are introducing us to their friends. And there's this idea that, I mean, it's just like this limitless array of folks that we bump into in life, whether it's through, you know, I think about spin class, yoga class, university, all these different places where we're we're exposed to different people and we're looking to connect. We're kind of programmed, you know, throughout life to build connections. But as we get older, we get more set in our ways. Our routines may be much smaller. We might find a job. We might be able to meet the people on our job, the people we see on our dog walk, but we might not be so engaged in the greater world. And that's the danger. Um, I think in older adulthood, because families, you know, everyone is transient now. People grow up in one town, they move across country, they move across around the globe. And so as we get older, there are less opportunities for that regular engagement. And it's so much easier. It just becomes easier to isolate. The older we get, the easier it is to remain you know, kind of confined to ourselves. And we don't have that same drive that we might have when we were younger to reach out and connect. And that's why it's so important, I think, that we sometimes have to force friend older adults. We have to make sure we're checking in on people, someone in your neighborhood. We have to be the ones, those of us who are younger, who are more able, who may be more ambulatory, need to be caretakers and kin keepers. Even if it's fictive kin and not real relations, we have to be willing to reach out to folks who may be isolated and unable to maintain those connections because opportunities grow smaller over time. Now, until I saw the title of your book, I never sort of thought about the rules of friendship. But there are rules. And if you don't know them, that's how you're most likely to get into the problem of having toxic friendships. So you've put the rules, and there's 10 of them, into three categories. So we've got being ones, doing ones, and refraining ones. So what are being rules? And then we'll go through the being rules. Well, being rules are how you should present in a relationship. Who should I be? How should I be? And what? how do I need to show up? in this relationship. So kind of like the traits I'm bringing, are they the traits that are going to really first create and then maintain a healthy relationship? So let's have the first one. Trust and confide in your friends and be trustworthy in return. Why is that perhaps even the most important rule of all? You know, I think it is the most important rule of all, because if we aren't able to trust someone, if we aren't able to feel that they trust us, you you lack that sense of longevity to the relationship. I think about, gosh, you know, why do relationships break up? Think about, I think about romantic relationships. Someone loses trust in their partner and it is so hard to rebuild that trust. You know, we we have that kind of image of it. Someone's been, you know, infidelity, whatever it might be. But in friendships, it's not so much infidelity, but it's, are you there for that person when they need you? Do you make promises, you know, that, that you're not keeping? And are you someone they feel safe with? And if we don't feel safe with someone, that's not a healthy relationship. And when we think of toxic relationships, 
for me, it's more about folks that aren't healthy for us. Not necessarily, there's, there's not like necessarily one big toxic moment, which can happen, but the idea that this relationship's not good for me because if, if they're not going to be there for me, then what is the purpose of working hard to be there for them? And it's this idea that we really need to be that person. This is a true blue that we are a person of our word. And these kind of are explicated throughout the rules, but the idea that we really need to show up fully and a hundred percent for that person. And perhaps this is the problem sometimes in male relationships. Us men are not very good at confiding. And you sort of, if you can confide, you can bring the relationship into a whole different area. I'm glad you pointed that out. That is a wonderful way to put that. Because I think when we think about men, as I said, you know, the term activity friendships or acquaintances, usually kind of what springs to mind, because men don't self-disclose in the same way that women want to. And women want to share. Women want to dump. Uh, You know, I have a bad day. I want to call my friend and say, here's what happened to me today. And so often men feel like to call and to need or to confide is possibly to be seen as weak or vulnerable. And we need to see, oftentimes we feel like men need to be strong and keep it together so that they can be the protectors. But we forget that all of us have needs and emotional needs that need to be met. And it can be hard. And I think that's that sense of intimacy and vulnerability to be able to confide in someone. And it's like coming to counseling for men. Sometimes when I've worked with couples, men have a harder time really sharing what's going on below the surface. You know, they'll use their actions as evidence of what's going on versus talking about their feelings because it's easier, it's safer. And being intimate is a risk in itself. And so learning how to confide in others and then enjoying that experience of sharing your feelings because it's reward. It's like therapy works. We talk about what's going on. We share our feelings. We're validated by our therapist and it feels good. And friends validate us. They validate the truth, the authenticity of us and our experiences. Because I once had a, a male client who was going to his 20th anniversary from leaving university or graduating from university. And out of the blue, I sort of said, will you tell your your friends that you're in therapy at the moment? And he said, I don't know. And I said, how do you think they'll respond? And I said, well, you might actually deepen the friendship. And so next week he came back and he said, I did tell my my friends and my year mates that I was in therapy. And every last one of them beyond one was actually in therapy themselves. <laughs> and they agreed that the person who wasn't in therapy should be in therapy. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. And that is so true because therapy is, it just, it changes so much in your life. And it's such a safe space and a safety net when we need that, when we really need to reach out. And if you don't have friends that you can be vulnerable with, finding a professional that can help you is so important because life is complicated. Like Life is crazy. Relationships are messy. And there are places we need to be able to kind of spill what's going on and kind of tease through what's going on in our heads and our hearts so that we're able to see it more clearly. And that's what, to me, therapy provides, a place where we can see ourselves much more clearly. And for men, yeah, it's kind of scary to say, this is what I'm feeling. This is what is happening. But then when you share, you make it safe for other people to share too. And the same with this self-disclosure to friends. It deepens relationships. So let's look at the second of the rules for friendship. Show your friends empathy and positive regard. Yeah. You know, when we learn to be counselors, you know, one of the first things we learn, the core conditions is unconditional positive regard. And it's so important. And I think that's, we have to love our friends even when they make mistakes. We have to love our friends even when they're doing things we can't imagine why they're doing them. We've got to be there and offer that unconditional positive regard and empathize with them. Yeah, I can see you're going through a rough time right now. Sure, that's not something I would have done, but I can see how you would do that. It's making it okay for our friends to be human. And that's what we need most from other people. We need that sense that it's okay to be who we are, to be confused, to be fallible, and not to be perfect. And when we're able to do that for our friends, they're more willing to do that for us. So the third of the rules for friendship in being is one that makes me want to put my hands on my hips and stamp my feet with my inner little child going, (laughs) no, which is understand your friends 
have other friendships and be accepting of those. Yeah, that is a tough one, Andy. That is, you know, I remember when I had, my daughter was young and if there were two little girls, if it was my daughter and one other little girl, things went smoothly. If there were three, it was a crowd. There's this idea that we want, you know, to hold on to these people. It's like, I want this friend all to myself because I love her so much. But we have to recognize that, you know, when we put all of our emotional needs on one other person, we're overwhelming that person and we're shortchanging ourselves by expecting that one person to be our BFF and only friend. And it also shortchanges that person because it keeps them locked into the sense of, I've got to care for this other person. It's like romantic relationships when the dependency gets so strong, no one person can serve as the emotional support for another person. You've got to have that network of relationships. And also being jealous, you know, it's hard, you know, oh, you got invited to the party and I didn't, or oh, you're going to the concert or the event with this person and they didn't ask me to go too. Our feelings are going to get hurt in life. And, you know, I think when, when we have children or we're children, you know, we might have parents who have to remind us life isn't fair. You know, life isn't fair all the time, but if we do our fair share, we'll get our fair share in return. So now we come on to doing rules for friendship. What are doing rules? Yeah, doing the rules are the things we, how, you know, the first, how we show up, how we engage with, what, what we present, kind of like the raw materials we bring to the classroom, to the relationship, to the world. And the doing rules are the things we need to do to ensure that that friendship stays strong. So the first one I don't think we really need to talk about very much. We've sort of already covered, which is give your friends emotional support. The next one is volunteer practical support when needed. And I think the stress there is the volunteer, isn't it? Yeah. You know, you know, those people that, yeah, if I I have to ask a friend to do this, I've got to ask my, you know, it's the same way. And I think I go to romantic relationships too, because healthy relationships are healthy relationships, whether it's, you know, part two part romantic partners, whether it's friends, whether it's parent, child, whatever it might be, worker, employer, you know, there's people, yeah, well, if I ask them, they'll do it. And you get tired of having to ask, you want them to recognize what you need when you need it. And you don't want to have to feel like you're burdening them. And so when a friend is moving, you know, ah, you know, I, I don't feel able to help you physically move, but I'm happy to bring the pizza and the beer. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. I heard you. Yeah. you got a new job. You got a job interview. You, you, you don't have anything to wear sure why don't we go shopping together or yeah let me do help practice your interview or help you know, if you're still in university let me help you practice your presentation i mean it's caring about your friend's life their world and knowing them well enough to know what they need and being willing to volunteer to help and offer that kind of support without waiting to be asked can i give you a lift to the hospital to visit your mother yes Exactly that. Exactly that. Knowing that this person's under stress or under, you know, that there's probably anxiety attached to the situation and giving instrumental support that's actually helpful. You know, sometimes also we also have to say, here's what I need you to do to help me. You know, because people say, oh, let me know what I can do. Well, maybe I need dinner brought in this week or maybe I need this. And so being willing to name what you need instead of expecting people to be mind readers because, you know, we always get frustrated when we expect people to read our minds because we're all unique and different. Here's another one that's really difficult and that's repay favours without being asked because I'm terrible. I have trouble keeping track of, you know, who paid for the meal last time sort of kind of stuff. Yeah. And and it is important to repay those favors. You know, I think money and friendship is never a good mix. And any, any, Mm. I mean, but carrying, you know, buying lunch one day, you know, but no, it's kind of like that idea um, that we shouldn't have to say, well, you know, you, you, I gave you a ride the last three times to work, you know, give me a ride today. You shouldn't have to bring up what's happened in the past. You should say, yeah, I've been helping you a lot. You know, would you mind helping me and, or just volunteer, or if someone does that for you, you just volunteer, I'm going to do this for you today, or it's my turn to do it. And being willing to invest in a friendship and recognizing that, Ideally, we all give equally of our time, of our energy, of whatever resource it might be, but we don't always give equally in a 24-hour period or a one-week period, taking that long-range view. I once had a a female client who had 
lots of friends that would always be phoning her for emotional support. Um, in fact, she used to turn her phone off at te- after 10 o'clock to stop them calling her. Mm-hmm. And she didn't switch it on before nine or something like that. I mean, she was doing shifts. Yes. And then she had cancer herself oh, and all of these friends were nowhere to be found. Right. And th- and they did not. And, and, and she was didn't realize that how she, sometimes we don't know we're being used until we find out we're being used and how heartbreaking that had to be for her that she was able to be there for so many people. But sometimes when we set friendships up, we set the rules on relationships. And it seems like one of her rules was you can call me almost any time and I'll be there for you. You know, and I think those boundaries, if we don't have healthy boundaries in a relationship, then these things can happen, that we have to be really clear up front. And the quicker we talk about our feelings when we're frustrated, like, oh, you know, everyone's always reaching out to me. Sometimes I need to feel like there's someone I can reach out to. Would you be that friend? And often these things were set up when you were children. I mean, unfortunately, quite a lot of people have parents that turn them into partners and so that they're always there for their mother or whatever. And it's actually very difficult to ask and say, you know, enough because you feel when you're a child, you can't say enough to your mother. But friendship is a very good place to try these skills out of saying no, because you've only got one mother, but you've got lots of friends. So you can experiment more with friends than you can with your mother, for example. I appreciate you talking about that because that parentification of children and children do learn what they live. You know, the rules of relationships we learn before we even can speak, before we can walk. And so recognizing that friendships should be more of an equal situation, you know, kind of the parent child relationship. We know that we've got to be there for our parent in whatever way they're trying to make us be there because we depend on that parent to care for us growing up. But when we're adults, we need to really recognize that all relationships should be give and take situations and no one should be expected to give 99% and one person take 1%. You know, being able to say no, if we say no to a friend and we say it with care and love and we care about you, but we can't be there for you in that way. If a friendship falls away, that's not the fault of us. It's the fault of our friend. And it's not really the kind of friend that you need to carry along with you through life. If they're not going to be there for us, if they can't take a no, this is where I end and where you begin kind of boundary setting, then that relationship isn't one that we really need to continue to invest in. So the seventh rule, stand up for your friend and their interests when they're not there. Yeah, you know, that's an important one because so often we'll allow people to talk poorly about a friend, we'll talk badly about a friend, but we need to be there for our friends 24-7 and defending their honor, defending their integrity. And if we're not defending our friends, if we're not standing up for them, even if they're not there, we're not really a friend to that person because we're really allowing other people to take advantage of that friend and we're not doing anything about it. We should call out folks, same way with other hot topic issues. If you allow people to talk poorly about a friend, about any particular group, we're condoning that behavior by not standing up and calling it out when we see it. Now, the the third set of rules are refraining rules. So these are the things that we refrain from doing. Let's have a look at the first one. Eight, do not bring down or intentionally annoy your friends. <laughs> you know, there's some friends that seem to take, they're just hang dogs. They seem to take pleasure in feeling bad and they don't want other people to feel good. They'll be friends like if something goes right for you, you know, they're going to they're gonna talk about what's going wrong for them, that they have a hard time letting other people be happy because they want people, they, you know, misery loves company and I'm going to bring you down and and I'm going to immerse you in the misery I'm feeling because I'll feel better if you feel bad too. Do not criticize a friend in front of others. Yeah. You know, it's really important. Again, it's kind of like protecting that friend, standing up for that friend. And it's also When you criticize a friend in front of others, in a way, it's kind of like criticizing your partner. There are things that you're allowed to do, you know, behind closed doors, but there are things you shouldn't do out in public because that person, someone that what you share is going to get back to that friend. You know, we have to be people of our words and we have to be 
again, is that trustworthiness. If I can't trust you not to say unkind things about me when you're with other people, that's not a friend. That's not a friend. You're someone that uses me when you need me or, you know, but you're not going to be the kind of person I could consider a friend. And the final one, no expressions of jealousy about other friends. So it's okay to be jealous because it's a natural human emotion, but keep it to yourself. Yeah, keep it to yourself. You know, when I, you know, when someone's, I have a kind of short story. When I had just had a child and things were going very well for me in my life, I had a friend who said, it must be so nice to be you. You've done this, you've done that, you've got a new baby. And it was like, I love you so much, but look at all the things that, you know, you've got and how wonderful it must be to be you. And it was done in a way that was expressing jealousy, not joy at my happiness. And it's like, you know, don't be jealous. You be happy for your friends, celebrate their successes. If someone's going to be envious, bring their negative feelings towards our happiness. I'm not going to want that person around when things are going right, because I just know they're going to try to bring me down. Envy, jealousy, you know, we think about the deadly, you know, the, the, the seven deadly sins, you know, those emotions and that envy and jealousy is one of them because it's not healthy to carry that kind of negative emotion to a friend because it colors the way you feel and, and it'll, it'll leak out. And it's just, we don't want to be, we want friends who are happy for us when we, when we celebrate joys, not ones who make us feel guilty for having good fortune in this life. So did you become interested in the idea of toxic relationships and toxic friendships because you had a toxic friendship yourself? (laughs) Well, interestingly enough, the first book I wrote was Friends Forever, How Girls and Women Forge Lasting Relationships. And so many women said, we're telling their stories. And we interviewed hundreds of women about friendships, their earliest friendships. And they all said, well, let me tell you about this friend that did me wrong. So many people had this negative story that they wanted to share about how they'd been wronged or hurt or what had blown up a friendship. I said, well, this is important to do. This is important to know because friendships matter so much. It's such a, it's an easy topic to talk to anyone about because especially women, because like I said, friendships are who we are. It's how we deal in life. We, 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 measure our success by how healthy our relationships are with others. And so people want to say, here's, and it's kind of like, you know, what we don't want to do. And the toxic friendship book said, you know, kind of each it shared scenarios and talked about, here's what you can do if this happens. Here's, you know, is this friendship worth working towards or do you think you need to end this friendship? So the idea that relationships are never easy and you have to make calls about what is this friendship worth to me to deal with or to let it go. Have you ever ended a friendship? I have ended a friendship, not due volition, more like it wasn't called ghosting at the time. The one, you know, one I think about was a friend from college who, when I was planning a wedding, my wedding, she suddenly started going, you know, choosing to put my needs behind everything. And it was envy. It was jealousy. There were a lot of things going on. And so once the wedding came, once I was married, I never heard from them again. You know, I sent, I'd reached out a couple of times, but they, they, it was like, and it ended and I always wondered, you know, what could have gone differently? What was it that I'd done? And they never, they wouldn't respond. I couldn't make it work. Fast forward 20 some years later during the pandemic and I get an email from this person who brings me up to speed on what they had done, you know, how the friendship had meant so much at the time in our, you know, when we were younger and kind of sharing, here's what I've done with my life. I reach out and say, it's so good to hear from you. This friend never responded. So I look wow. at it as this, this is, she needed to do this to get it off her conscience, but she wasn't in a place where she wanted to re-engage. And so kind of an interesting story. And that was after I'd written the friendship book and the toxic friendship book. So it was kind of, and, and it was during that period during the pandemic when so many of us felt moved to reconnect with folks we'd not talked to, seen in, in decades. This need to kind of read that. And that tells us how important relationships are, that when the world is falling apart, what we need most are people to connect with. Because it seems to me there's two ways of ending friendships. There's the sort of upfront sort of kind of, you know, I'm I'm really hurt because you did X, Y, Z, and mm-hmm. you're sort of honest about it. And then there's the sneaky ending where you sort of, oh, I'd love to, but I'm just not available sort of kind yeah. of thing. And, you know, you've done it seven times and somebody gets the hint. Finally, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that is kind of the way, you know, actually there's three ways because then there's the exciting blow up. Where, you know, you don't just say, you know, this friendship isn't working any longer. It's that some event happens, some major event happens, and the friendship just dissolves in a cloud of of smoke. And I think 
the, of course, the best way, always the best way is to say what you're feeling. And, and, you know, as, as a fellow um, therapist, you know how important it is to be able to speak what's in your heart and put out there what's going on in here. Because if you don't, you know, like I said, my friend from early years, I'll never know. I, you know, she, she sent this wonderful kind email. And then when I reached back out, it was like invisible ghosting. I'll never know, you know, what it was, but I'll know that she was affected by, and think about that, that we're affected, we're affected by relationships. You can probably remember your earliest friendships. You can probably remember the biggest fight you ever had with a friend. And so the friendships that you lose along the way, and some of them dissolve naturally, and that's okay. You know, the friends you had in college might not be the friends you need now. You know, you may have fond memories, but it's okay to let friendships kind of dissolve. But it's best if your a friendship is coming to an end and it's someone that you might bump into during the next, you know, decade of your life to have a conversation about it. And if you speak about it, there's a chance that you might be able to resolve it. Absolutely. You know, I think that most of us want to maintain relationships. I think that, you know, we we don't want to have bad blood between ourselves and other people. The majority of us, you know, want harmony, want conviviality, want to be able to meet people out on the streets and not feel like, oh, I've got to cross the sidewalk because I see this person down the road. And so by talking about it, you can kind of figure out, well, I was a little bit in the wrong and you're admitting your part in this. Maybe I misunderstood. Maybe you misunderstood. And by clarifying, we really can be able to address the issue, work through the issue and keep going forward. So how do we judge the severity of the breaking of the rules so that, you know, it's not me throwing what we would call in school a wetty? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that it really is something that is, you know, fundamentally bad. Yeah. You know, everybody has different, and I think this comes down to values. You know, if you want to know who I am, see what I value, you know, observe what I value in life. And some of us value relationships so much that we can accept bad behavior. You know, for those of us who have few friends, we might tolerate someone's really bad behavior because we're so afraid of having no friends. But really, we have to think, is what they've done something that has so impacted me that I can't live with myself if I continue this relationship, that I can't fully trust this person again? And it really is about being able to trust that someone goofed up or I goofed up and we feel safe enough to say, yeah, I admit my part in the the wrong or you're willing to admit that and I'm willing to trust you. And all of us have different kind of valences for what trust looks like with us and forgiveness. You know, every, you work with couples, you know that some folks can forgive a world of things other people can't. So if this friendship is essential to our well-being, then it's best we talk about it. We see if we can work through it. Is the person... Do they seem invested? Are they showing they're invested and keeping the relationship going? Or are we feeling that we are so wronged that in our hearts we know that we just can't let ourselves go there again because we don't want to risk being hurt that badly again? So that's the difference between it being toxic and just falling out. Yeah. Yeah. I think that it is affecting me so much that I can't feel good about myself if I go back in this relationship. Because everybody is so unique and individual and our levels of tolerance for bad behavior is so different. It's really, and sometimes we have to work it through with the counselor, with another friend, with the partner. We have to talk about it because sometimes if we talk things through and try to get that external perspective, we can realize, well, what they did really wasn't that bad. And really, it's okay for me to let it go. Sometimes we need to kind of step outside ourselves. So do you think from time to time we should have a clear out of friends? So these aren't people who've done us bad, but we're just sort of going through the motions. I mean, should we have a clear out or is that a bit of a a bad friend sort of kind of activity? (laughs) If you you don't make that cut, off you go. Off you go. Yeah, you're off the the team, survivor. During the pandemic, I don't know what you've read in the news. A lot was written about, and I called it friendscaping. It was in New York Times. It was, I was on Good Morning America. I've talked about friendscaping in multiple places. I think the human has a limited capacity to maintain strong relationships with millions of people throughout their lives. We just don't have the time, the resources. I don't think we have to necessarily in relationships. Sometimes we have to give ourselves permission. If we don't want to say, you know, this, this friendship, you know, I'm snipping, I'm pruning you, you're gone. It's more like, 
I've got to step back from this relationship and I have permission not to try to be everyone's best friend. And I bet we have relationships, we have acquaintanceships, we have social friends, activity friends. We have a million different types of friends. And it's really important that our friendships are such that they're bringing us joy and satisfaction and giving us meaning and not draining us. And when we try to be everyone's best friend, you know, you can have a million friends. I won't argue, Andrew, if you tell me you have millions of friends, I'll believe that. But I bet there's a limited number that you really have the time to invest in a relationship that is active, engaging, dynamic, and ongoing, because we just don't have that capacity as humans. I think Dunbar's number says we could know 150 people or so, but really, we're only going to really have in life, if we have three to five friends, I mean, that's my research in life satisfaction and friendship. The number of close friends people feel is most satisfying is three to five. The number of people that people think is ideal is three to five. And I really think having three to five good friends, strong friends that we can really commit energy and resources to, and I don't mean resources like financial unless that's part of it, but more that energy, time, caring, that's all we need. And letting go of other friends, stepping back from relationships, that's just part of growth and change. You know, we don't have to leave ill feelings behind. We just know that people often grow apart and that's okay. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. Let me tell you about my Substack newsletter, because I'd love you to subscribe to it. It's a mixture of relationship advice, my thought on building a meaningful life, and it's somewhere you can tell me your thoughts and suggest ideas as well. You can find everything at themeaningfullife.substack.com, so please do sign up. I'll give you the address again, themeaningfullife.substack.com. Details can also be found in the show notes. And if you'd like to contribute and get another opinion, a sort of piece of uh, friendly um, mirroring, you can do so by writing to myself and my guests. And if you go to my website, www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcasts, and if you go down that section, you'll find a place where you can contribute to the show. And this is what this lady has done. I've fallen out with a friend. Nothing particularly serious, it's happened many times before, but she has a history of blocking people and cutting them out of her life. We've known each other since the first week of university, and that's over 30 years ago, so this is one of my oldest friends. All that history, shared confidences, knowing both my parents, my mother has passed on, so I'm sure I will eventually make up with her. However, I know what that will take. I will have to apologise, no problem with that, but it will be all my fault. I have to state that. Listen to her upset how I'm not a good friend, eat many helpings of humble pie, and we'll move on. Until the next time. Sometimes I feel that there are all these buried topics that are still swirling around. There are certainly lots of no-go areas, like her work, her sister. I think she's jealous because life has been kinder to me than it has been to her. So I do understand. Do you understand this dilemma, Suzanne? It seems like the person writing the letter cares greatly about maintaining this relationship. And she seems very willing to go beyond what the other person can do for the relationship to maintain it. It's interesting how much this woman has invested in the relationship, but this tells us that that shared history is so important. You know, I think sharing history with people, we're able to forgive more, the larger the investment we've made along the way. And it sounds to me that her friend, it tickles me because as I shared my story about my friend when I had my baby, had written the letter with that sense of jealousy about the things. And it was kind of a backhanded kind of thing. And when folks envy who we are, we almost feel occasionally like, well, we have to be especially nice because look how fortunate we are. And it sounds like the friend who is being written about has put this person in a position where she has to be the caretaker of the other person and admit faults that maybe not be her own true faults. 
And I would ask you, is this a pattern? Are you a caregiver in lots of relationships? Yeah. Do you feel, is this the place you feel the most comfortable in? Yeah, I mean, that can happen. Yeah, that we do become the caregivers in relationships. You see it in romantic relationships. You see it in friendships, that someone is almost like the stronger one sometimes and sees their role as caring for and giving in to the other person. Is it healthy for this woman to always be the one to apologize if she's not the uh-uh. one? Yep, yep, okay. If she's not at fault, it's she said, and, and what she's done is created a pattern where her friend is gonna, she says it's happened many times. She blocks people in her life. And I'd have to wonder what the letter writer is getting out of the relationship because we only do the things that feed us. When we have a choice, we're going to do the thing that will bring the greatest reward. And so it sounds like this person really needs to feel that they are the hero in this relationship and she's willing to do it. And I do understand because, you know, you can't replace these kind of friends. You know, I have a friend who I've known since I was seven and, you know, we don't see each other for chunks of time. But somebody who's actually seen me in short trousers and, you know, (laughs) I mean, and in fact, you know, it's come to both of my parents' funerals. You know, that is somebody who has been there the whole way through, and that Mm -hmm. is incredibly valuable. So, you know, I understand all of that. And probably, you know, you you are going to cut this friend more slack, but Mm -hmm. I just think that it might be worth you looking at this pattern in all your relationships, because sometimes when we're forever giving and we're not receiving, we get exhausted and we get crabby and it's not good for us. You know, are you actually able to receive help yourself? You know, can you be vulnerable rather than the caregiver all the time? Absolutely. Can you let yourself be needy? Can you let yourself be the one that needs to ask for assistance? And, you know, how I show up in friendships is very similar to how I show up in all my relationships because we are typically relatively congruent because we only know one way to be. And when we've been in a relationship this long, you value that, that history. You can't put 50 years, 30 years of history into a friend you just met yesterday. And that's the important thing to remember that friendships are, you know, kind of we give and take over time. And like I said, there's something that the letter writer receives from that relationship and she may feel validated as a caregiver. And that may be important to her, but she also needs to let herself, as you said, be vulnerable and allow herself to need others, not just be the one other people need. And I think that what you say about how we show up in friendship is how we show up in all of our relationships is a really important learning point for all of this. And often in our friendships, it's a lower risk place to experiment doing something slightly different. Yeah, it's very true. Sometimes we can tolerate things from friends that we won't tolerate in our partners. You know, and that's one thing we get a little bit more give because we accept our friends as they are. And we're not trying to change our friends the way off, the way people often try to change their partners. That's the big difference. And we like diversity in our friendships and we like people, you know, who push us, who encourage us to grow. And yeah, we can say, okay, this is who they are. This is the way they talk. I'm not going to worry about it. You go out with your partner. Don't say that. That embarrasses me. Don't dress like that. We're this. So there is more freedom in that kind of friendship because we allow our friends. We don't, we don't identify so closely with our friends that we feel that they reflect so much on us in that way. And perhaps we should cut our partners a bit more slack as well. Yeah, I think we really should. I think we can't expect a partner to be exactly what we want because we are fallible too. And our partners who don't follow exactly what we want them to do can push us to grow. And I think we shouldn't get stuck in routines and patterns with partners, with friends and relationships. So thank you very much for being a witness on The Meaningful Life. I have to turn the tables on on you and ask what makes your life meaningful. For me, relationships are what give my life meaning, whether it's my relationship with my partner, with my children, with my friends, with the people with whom I work. Relationships are where we find that sense of meaning. And for me too, being a facilitator of growth and development of other people, whether it's in my role as department chair or university professor or as counselor or friend or partner, helping other people grow and change pushes me to grow and change too. And that that's where I find the most meaning. Well, this is where we're going to have to end the conversation unless you are a supporter of The Meaningful Life because the conversation is going to continue. We're going to talk about how to detoxify a friendship because sometimes you can't 
leave that friendship, or at least not easily. Maybe, for example, their neighbours or the, you work with them. How can you get the toxicity out? That's what I'm going to be talking to Suzanne about. And I'm also going to be asking her about three things she knows deep down to be true. And if you'd like to hear that, you can subscribe directly to the bonus material via Apple or Spotify. We're also available on Amazon Music. And if you want to become a supporter of The Meaningful Life, here are the details of how to do it. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.